Good afternoon, everybody. Go ahead and bring things to order here. My name is Ken Weinstein. It's a real pleasure to be here to preside over today's session with Lisa Monaco. I want to welcome everybody to today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting with Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor Lisa O. Monaco. This meeting is part of the Kenneth A. Moscow Memorial Lecture on Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Series, which honors the memory of Kenneth A. Moscow, a longtime CFR member who had a distinguished career in the intelligence community. And further details about his life and professional accomplishments can be found in the booklet for today's meeting. I'd like to extend a special welcome and thanks to Keith Moscow, as well as members and guests of the family who are in attendance today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa to you. Lisa, besides being an old friend, is a tremendous public servant. She assumed the duties of the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism and Deputy National Security Advisor on March 8th of 2013. And in that capacity, she advises the President on all aspects of counterterrorism policy and strategy, as well as the coordination of all Homeland Security-related activities throughout the executive branch. Prior to that, she served as the Assistant Attorney General for National Security from 2011 to 2013. And then prior to that, she was the Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General, which is an important function in the Deputy Attorney General's Office of Maine Justice. Before that position, she was over at the FBI, where she was Chief of Staff to Director Robert Mueller and also Special Counsel to him prior to that. From 2001 to 2007, Lisa served as a federal prosecutor. She was, on, she was appointed to the Enron Task Force, where she was co-lead trial counsel in the prosecution of five former executives of Enron Broadband Services. For her work on that task force, she received the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service, which is the highest award given by the Justice Department. Back in 1998 to 2001, prior to being a federal prosecutor, she was counsel to Attorney General Janet Reno, providing advice and guidance on national security, law enforcement, budget, and oversight issues. And prior to joining DOJ, she clerked for the Honorable Jane Roth of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. She received her JD from the University of Chicago and a BA from Harvard University. I'd like to welcome Lisa to the stand and thank her for appearing today. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, Ken was reverting to his prosecutor days when he asked, he welcomed me to the stand. <laughs> He's reverting to our common prosecutor days. The thing that um, Ken didn't tell you is that I've basically been stalking him my whole career from the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. where, where Ken served as the U.S. Attorney uh, to the FBI where Ken was also Chief of Staff to Director Mueller to the Department of Justice, where Ken was also the Assistant Attorney General for National Security. And of course, uh, he preceded me. Uh, he's one of my predecessors uh, in my current job. So uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be back with an old friend. It's also very good and a real pleasure uh, to be delivering the Kenneth Moscow Memorial Lecture. I had the opportunity to visit uh, with Keith just backstage here, and uh, we shared uh, a number of uh, stories about our common roots. For those of you who aren't aware, Ken Moscow, in addition to being the kind of guy who liked to run with the bulls in Pamplona, was a talented CIA operative. He hailed, as Keith and I discussed, from my hometown of Newton, Massachusetts. And he died tragically and far too young near the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro. His life and his work was like that of so many other intelligence men and women, uh, military men and women, homeland security, diplomatic and law enforcement uh, members. They all put their lives on the line every single day. They do so to keep our country safe. Today, I want to talk about the preeminent security threat that we face, the threat of terrorism, and how ISIL represents a new evolution of that threat, and how we are waging an innovative campaign to counter ISIL and, importantly, its barbaric ideology. Now, it was only three months ago that a married couple, Saeed Rizwan Farouk and Tashfin Malik, walked into an office gathering in San Bernardino 
and opened fire. They had assault rifles and a veritable armory with them and, and in their home, including pipe bombs. They also had a six-month-old daughter who they left with their grandmother, with her grandmother, before they began their murderous rampage. 14 people were killed, 22 were wounded. Saeed Farouk was an American citizen. Like the recent attacks from Paris to Chattanooga, the San Bernardino attack was a stark reminder that for all of our vigilance, for all of our focus, the specter of terrorism persists, both for Americans and for our allies. Instability from Syria to Somalia provides fertile ground for extremism, and sometimes, tragically, the attackers are homegrown. But I mentioned San Bernardino not just because it was the worst terrorist attack on the United States since 9-11, but because it was a starkly different kind of attack. Simply put, the terrorist threat we confront today, almost 15 years after that terrible September day, the terrorist threat has evolved, and it's done so dramatically. What distinguishes the threat today is that it is broader, more diffuse, and less predictable than at any time since 9-11. Where we once spoke of hierarchical networks and sleeper cells, much of the threat today is online, distributed across the globe. While we continue to see planning for sophisticated and coordinated attacks, such as those in Paris, terrorism today is increasingly defined by small cells or lone actors, sometimes with little or no direct contact with terrorist organizations. Those people have succumbed to violent extremism. It's what you might call opportunistic or a do-it-yourself terrorism. The primary example of this new type of terrorism is the cancer of ISIL. Originally an outgrowth of al-Qaeda in Iraq, in the past two years, ISIL has eclipsed core al-Qaeda as the principal terrorist threat we face. The world has been shocked by the butchery and the depravity of these twisted fanatics. From their stronghold in Raqqa, Syria, ISIL has displayed an apocalyptic ambition and an unprecedented brutality. They crucify their victims and burn alive others. They enslave women and children and teach that rape is an expression of God's will. They behead innocents and broadcast their barbarism to the world. It's not only ISIL's unconscionable brutality that troubles us. What keeps me up at night is that this threat is unlike what we've seen before. Al-Qaeda focused on launching catastrophic attacks against the West, the so-called far enemy. They used the internet to post grainy videos and propaganda in PDF form. ISIL is very different. A recent report on ISIL was subtitled, From Retweets to Raqqa. And that, I think, underscores the scale of our challenge. These fanatics are online and on the ground. They are at once terrorists, insurgents, and bureaucrats attempting to control a territory that was at one point larger than the United Kingdom. ISIL supporters have shown an ability to engineer high-profile attacks, like blowing up a Russian airliner over the Sinai Peninsula. But they also direct foreign fighters to attack soft targets, as they did in Paris. They've deployed crude but deadly chemical weapons, which pose an imminent threat to Syrians and Iraqis. And they use, through their use of social media, ISIL has distributed the threat globally. They can inspire sympathizers and adherents anywhere, and at one time turn lost souls to soulless killers. And they do it whether it's in Bangladesh or in San Bernardino. So even as we focus on ISIL, we can't take our eye off of Al-Qaeda, its affiliates or its adherents. From North Africa to South Asia, their desire to strike at American interests and citizens warrants our continued vigilance. 
the most active of these affiliates, remains al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and it has attempted to attack the United States multiple times. But American airstrikes and international pressure have thwarted AQAP's uh, external plots, and it has targeted their leadership. We continue to disrupt plots also from al-Qaeda's largest affiliate, the Nusra Front, operating in Syria. And we're paying very close attention to groups like al-Shabaab and al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which has recently shown through brutal attacks in Mali and Burkina Faso that it too remains dangerous. Taken together, these all form a toxic brew. And the different threat, though, that ISIL poses is a danger that we cannot ignore nor underestimate. This is not an entity we can accommodate. So I'll say it again. Today, ISIL, in all of its manifestations, insurgent army, foreign fighter magnet, social media phenomenon, external operations cadre, ISIL is the principal counterterrorism threat we face as a nation. Against this backdrop, we are applying the lessons learned in our fight against Al Qaeda to a new and adaptive enemy. Thanks to the brave military and intelligence personnel that we have, and we have disrupted Al Qaeda's finances and training camps, we've hunted down their leaders, including, of course, Osama bin Laden and many others. Core Al Qaeda, as we knew it 15 years ago, has been decimated. Al Qaeda's remaining leaders in Afghanistan and Pakistan spend more time plotting to survive than plotting attacks. But we will not let up our relentless pressure. Now, our success against Al Qaeda is the result of the transformation that our national security apparatus has undergone over the past 14 years. After 9 11, we implemented a series of legal, structural, and cultural reforms to break down the barriers that had grown up between law enforcement, the intelligence community, the military, and the functions not named at the time that we now call homeland security. I've seen, first at the FBI, then at the Department of Justice, and now at the White House, how we brought intelligence and law enforcement tools together to confront this threat. We've adopted new normals in everything from airline travel to our interactions with partners overseas. And the courage and dedication of counterterrorism professionals across two administrations has succeeded in averting further large-scale catastrophic attacks on our homeland. So just as we're doing with Al Qaeda, we will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. As President Obama told the nation, we will prevail by being strong and smart, resilient and relentless, and by drawing upon every aspect of American power. As always, whether confronting Al Qaeda, ISIL, or another threat, we are guided in our counterterrorism efforts by several core principles. We will always take every appropriate lawful action to protect Americans at home and abroad from terrorist threats. We will protect our values by continuing to conduct our counterterrorism efforts as transparently as possible, with clear guidelines, strong oversight and accountability, and in full accordance with the rule of law. We will build and sustain effective multilateral coalitions and work with those partners to anticipate and annihilate terrorist organizations before they require an outsized military response and will integrate our counterterrorism actions with efforts to undermine the forces that fuel terrorists, like political oppression and lack of opportunity. In recent years, we have taken clear and specific steps to institutionalize our counterterrorism approach so that our military, intelligence, and law enforcement communities have the tools and the authorities they need to sustain the fight for years to come. This includes putting in place a durable legal and policy framework to guide our counterterrorism actions consistent with our values. As it applies to ISIL specifically, our strategy consists of five pillars. First, we are protecting the homeland. Second, we're engaging our partners. Third, 
we're taking direct action to target ISIL on the battlefield. Fourth, we're disrupting the factors that enable ISIL, like financing and foreign fighters. And fifth, we're taking creative steps to counter the violent extremism that fuels and swells ISIL's ranks. Our first pillar is the first part of my job title and will always be our first responsibility as the US government, protecting the homeland. Every day I meet with the president to discuss the threats that we face, whether it's terrorism, cyber attacks, or deadly viruses like Ebola, his first question is always, are we doing everything we can to protect the American people? He does not take his eye off that ball, ever. And I can tell you that the president and those of us on his national security team are focused every day on preventing future attacks at home and abroad, whether the terrorists are homegrown, ISIL-directed, or ISIL-inspired. Destroying ISIL starts with going after ISIL abroad. And as our second pillar recognizes, we cannot do it alone. The United States has built a broad coalition of 66 international partners. We're sharing vital intelligence, training, equipping, and empowering partners on the ground in Syria and Iraq. And together with our partners, we're working through a political process to diminish the terrible violence in Syria. The current cessation of hostilities is an opportunity to move that process forward even as we continue to isolate and hammer ISIL. And we are hammering ISIL on the ground through direct action, our third pillar. In Iraq and Syria, coalition forces have conducted almost 11,000 precision airstrikes. Today, these terrorists have lost about 40% of the territory that they once controlled in Iraq and 20% in Syria. Our operations are keeping ISIL guessing for fear of capture or feeling the full weight of the mightiest military on Earth. We estimate that our coalition is taking out key one to two key ISIL leaders every day. That includes ISIL's second in command, their finance chief, and Mohammed Mwazi, otherwise known as Jihadi John, who brutally has murdered Americans and others. Of course, ISIL can't survive without the fighters and the finances that sustain its barbaric enterprise. And that's pillar number four. And it's why we're working with partners to slow the flow of foreign fighters in and out of Iraq and Syria. ISIL has lost 10,000 or more frontline fighters. At the same time, we're choking off ISIL's ability to fund its terror. We're striking their oil infrastructure and making it harder for them to extort local populations. Inflation is up in ISIL-controlled areas. And if you're an ISIL fighter today, chances are you're being paid far less than you were last year. There must be no safe haven for these killers. We continue to go after ISIL wherever it tries to take root. In Libya, for instance, we've removed ISIL's leader there and recently struck an ISIL training camp. In all of these strikes, our operators do everything in their power to avoid civilian casualties. And in keeping with the President's commitment to transparency, I can announce today that in the coming weeks, the administration will publicly release an assessment of combatant and non-combatant casualties resulting from strikes taken outside areas of active hostilities since 2009. Going forward, these figures will be provided annually. We know that not only is greater transparency the right thing to do, it is the best way to maintain the legitimacy of our counterterrorism actions and the broad support of our allies. But no amount of airstrikes and no amount of military power alone can defeat these fanatics and their warped worldview once and for all. Our approach, initially tailored after 9-11 to fight a top-down terrorist network that operated more like a corporation than a secret army, our approach is adapting to fit today's diverse and decentralized threat. The only lasting answer to hateful ideologies are better ideas. So even as we target ISIL's men and its money, 
Our final pillar recognizes that we must also confront and defeat their twisted message. We focus on this front as well because ISIL is trying to occupy digital territory just as it is trying to occupy physical territory. They're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, they're on YouTube. There's something like 90,000 Twitter accounts associated with or sympathetic to ISIL, sometimes each with 50,000 followers. Last year, ISIL produced 7,000 slick pieces of propaganda disseminated by 43 distinct ISIL media offices. Now, I remember only a few years ago, the counterterrorism community was worried about an Al-Qaeda affiliate distributing an online magazine via a PDF file. That, frankly, looks like the eight-track tape version of what we're seeing now. With the click of a mouse, these internet-savvy extremists are poisoning the minds of people an ocean away. Many of these recruits have been middle class, seemingly well-adjusted in their communities, and of course, the FBI has investigated ISIL-inspired suspects in all 50 states. So this is not just an American or Western problem, though. We've seen from Nigeria to Indonesia, this is indeed a global problem. With allies and with our partners, we're working hard to expose ISIL's true nature, to highlight their hypocrisy. And it can't be underscored enough a group that claims to be defending Muslims is actually killing countless innocent Muslim men, women, and children. But we know that the US government is often not the best or most compelling voice for this message. That's why we're working to enable partners around the globe and in our communities who can convincingly speak against extremism. We've seen the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Malaysia all stepping up their efforts to discredit ISIL's claim to represent Islam. The State Department has created a new global engagement center, which will amplify and empower the voices of our international partners, from religious leaders to ISIL defectors themselves. And our Countering Violent Extremism Task Force, co-led by the Departments of Homeland Security and Justice, is coordinating our efforts across the US government. Ultimately, though, one of our most potent weapons against terrorist narratives is going to be the power of our ideas and the innovation that has made this country so great. For the past year, we've been working to partner with some of our nation's most imaginative companies. Tech firms like Facebook, Google, YouTube, and Instagram have all made strides removing terrorist content that violate their own terms of service and denying ISIL a digital safe haven. Already, Twitter has suspended roughly 125,000 ISIL-linked accounts in just the past six months. I want to commend these companies for the actions they've taken to date in removing ISIL's murderous online message. Now, our engagement with Silicon Valley on countering ISIL online has actually been more positive than you might think from reading the latest news. Last year, I went to Silicon Valley to initiate the White House's focus on innovating our way through this problem. I sat down with key tech leaders, social entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and students at the Stanford D School, their design school. Now, it may seem an odd choice for someone like myself who has spent two decades in government, but the setting was instructive and almost as important as the discussions themselves. In a space that was more akin to an ad agency or a creative design studio, we brainstormed how to prevent ISIL's use of technology to recruit, to radicalize, and to mobilize. And I've held similar sessions in Boston and in New York. And just a few weeks ago, we brought these worlds together, Madison Avenue, Silicon Valley, and even Hollywood, along with NGOs and civil society. The goal is to develop private sector approaches for countering violent extremism online. We call this the Madison Valleywood Project. These companies are exploring cutting edge ways to amplify credible voices to counter ISIL's destructive narrative. And they're just getting started 
but we think that the collaboration that could come from this project could be quite promising. But this can't be a top-down effort. It's got to come from empowered voices, like those I heard last September at a global youth summit in New York that was co-hosted by the White House and the Counter Extremism Project. Hundreds of young people gathered from 45 countries. They all came together to build digital platforms, all designed to help keep young people off the dark road to radicalization. And they came up with a host of ideas from supporting aspiring entrepreneurs to creating anti-extremist rap music. But even with all these creative and determined efforts, even with the constant vigilance that we apply, there will always be those who try to exploit our openness, to cause chaos, and to cause destruction. Homeland security has got to be about more than taking off our shoes when we fly. Whether we're confronting terrorism or a tornado, we've got to refuse to be terrorized, and we've got to rebuild when we get knocked down. And we've got to embrace one very simple truth, which is that a hateful and barbarous group like ISIL will not ever overcome our strength as Americans. A few months ago, I gathered at Arlington Cemetery with the families of those who were lost in the bombing of Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. For more than 25 years, the families of the fallen have mourned their friends and their family, but they've also celebrated countless weddings and births. They've lost loved ones, but they never lost hope. That's what makes this country stronger than any terrorist bomb or bullet. We see it in San Bernardino in the employee who returned to work in January, shaken but determined, in the woman wearing hijab who bowed her head to remember the victims, and in the disabled man who was a client of the center who held up a sign reading, I love you, IRC. We see it in Boston. After the marathon bombings, there was an attack on my hometown, where next month, 30,000 wicked determined runners will lace up their shoes and run the 120th running of the marathon. They will crest Heartbreak Hill, and they will show the true meaning of Boston Strong. So we face a cruel and very cunning adversary in ISIL. The tactics of terror have indeed transformed, and we have entered a new era. And as the president has made clear, this will be a generational struggle. But with the dedication of our brave men and women in uniform, our diplomats, intelligence and law enforcement officers, the support of our partners, the innovation of the private sector, and the strength and the resilience of the American people, we will meet and defeat this threat as we have others before it. Thank you very much. OK. So first, let me just say thanks, thank you, Lisa, for that really a tremendous overview of your counterterrorism efforts. I thought it was um, a good overview and really tremendously inspirational, actually. Um, so, um, but the one thing that intrigued me was that you're hanging out with Hollywood. I, <laughs> I, I don't remember how I'm not with Hollywood when I had the job. Really, um, I'm not doing it very well since I can't mic myself. <laughs> So I guess you're doing this job with a little more style than I did. Um, so this is the part of the, the, um, the event where I get to ask you a few questions and sort of keep our for prosecutor vein. I'll, mm -hmm. I get to cross-examine you. Um, the one question I had was you mentioned that a big part of your strategy is your foreign cooperation, working mm -hmm. with our partners. Uh, that obviously was a big part of the effort post 9-11 against al-Qaeda, and it was, I think, one of the strong points post 9-11. But as, is, as with any relationship, they ebbed and flowed. Um, I remember in 2006 talking to some of our partners over in Europe who were pushing back on the notion that this was a war against Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. In their minds, it was more of a law enforcement action. Do you see a different flavor in the relationship with the foreign partners as it relates to ISIL than it did over the years since 9-11 as it related to Al Qaeda? I see um, a common view when it comes to ISIL. And this is across the board. And it's interesting, um, I 
have taken many trips to the Middle East in this job, but uh, one thing that struck me several trips ago was how unified our Gulf partners were against ISIL. To a country, uh, they were um, expressed uh, complete horror at the fact that this group would claim to be Islamic. Uh, and so it has unified uh, Gulf partners. It has galvanized our European partners, certainly um, before, but certainly after the Paris attacks, uh, to do better on things like information sharing, an issue I know you worked on uh, when you were in my role and in preceding roles. So I think that there is a recognition that ISIL poses a distinct threat to uh, European countries um, in a way that is, uh, I do detect a difference than from Al Qaeda. One other question I'd like to raise. Um, you mentioned that there's been a good bit of press coverage of the relationship between the administration and Silicon Valley and the tech industry. Um, and obviously, the, the burning issue is encryption. Um, the, the tension between the value of encryption, um, but the need for the law enforcement and intelligence community to try to access signals intelligence, which is so, has been so critical to foiling the plots that um, we've seen since 9-11. Um, I, just watching the reporting over the last few weeks, it seems as though there have been sort of differing views on this issue coming out of the administration. Do you want to address that for us? Yeah, you know, I, I've seen some of that as well. And, you know, what's interesting to me is um, what I think has not been captured is that there is a recognition across the administration that uh, the virtues of strong encryption are without a doubt. So in my own role, um, whether it's counterterrorism operations, cybersecurity, uh, you name it, the, there is a tremendous value uh, in having strong encryption. There's no doubt about it. The president has said, there is not a world in which we don't want really strong encryption. And the same is true uh, from the Defense uh, Department to the intelligence community to um, the FBI and the Department of Justice, who have to worry about investigating and prosecuting uh, cyber intrusions of all stripes. So there is uniformity uh, about the value of strong encryption. There is also uniformity in the recognition that strong encryption poses real challenges. It, pros it poses real challenges to um, criminal and national security matters, to identifying uh, plots uh, in their nascent stages to their imminent stages. And in some times, uh, it poses an impossibility in identifying those uh, and ultimately prosecuting them. So uh, the notion that there isn't a recognition of an appreciation for strong encryption, I think, is just not true. OK, so now we get to um, open this up to invite members to join the conversation with questions. Um, just a reminder that this session is on the record. And if you would, please raise your hand. I'll recognize you, then wait until you receive the microphone from one of the gentlemen on the sides here. Stand, state your name and affiliation, and then ask a single question, if you would. Uh, try to keep it concise so that we have opportunity for as many people to ask questions as possible. Start with the gentleman here in the third row. Uh, John Gannon from uh, Georgetown University. Uh, uh, I think you've made a, a, a clear assessment of, of uh, ISIS as, as being uh, on a path of defeat. What happens, though, afterward, and would have to depend on the collaboration with, with uh, neighboring states, what role will Iran play in it? And, and to what degree do you think Iran can be brought in in a constructive way to establish um, a, a peaceful result? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think not one that we know the answer to yet. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we're working very hard to um, put forward and see take hold the cessation of hostilities, which is currently um, generally holding, although it's quite fragile. Uh, and I think there is every recognition uh, that uh, it is fragile and it's something um, that we have to uh, take every step to try and make sure it takes hold. And we're doing that, for instance, with a task force that's uh, sitting in Geneva 
um, evaluating and looking at uh, any violations. Um, it's been no secret that uh, we feel that the Russian activity, for instance, has um, really quite complicated uh, the uh, environment that uh, we're operating in in Syria. Um, so we're hopeful that the cessation uh, continues uh, to uh, maintain uh, and uh, want very much for those actors, like the Russians and others, who um, have taken steps to date to frankly complicate and impede, frankly, things like humanitarian access. Um, uh, we want them to be putting their energies towards a, ultimately a political solution, because at the end of the day, that's the only way that this, that this thing is going to, um, uh, that the violence is going to be able to be diminished. Woman in the second row right here, please. Thank you, uh, Kim Dozier with the Council and writing for the Daily Beast. So a question on the assessment. Um, will it include an assessment of casualties in places like Pakistan and Yemen, Somalia and Libya, in addition to places where it's Pentagon um, UAVs operating, Syria and Iraq? And did you consult with human rights groups like the folks sitting next to me um, in your assessment? How did you come up with the damage numbers? So first, the um, assessment that we will release, um, and as I noted, uh, we'll do so in the coming weeks. And it's something that we've been working on. I know it's issues that we've talked about. I've talked about with folks from a range of uh, human rights groups, civil society, and others. Uh, it will account for all counterterrorism actions outside the area of active hostilities uh, across the board. So, uh, and I'm not going to be more specific than that at this stage. Um, and we come to this um, as, first and foremost, this is a, a reflection of the President's commitment on transparency, going back to a speech he gave at the National Defense University in 2013, in which he laid out the principles and the policy standards that we apply in conducting counterterrorism uh, direct actions, whether capture or lethal. Uh, and it's fair to say that both um, the outlines of that policy, as well as getting to this point where we are committed to disclose uh, the assessment that I mentioned, comes as a result of that commitment, as well as many discussions with representatives from a range of human rights organizations. And I would say that um, we think it's pretty, pretty important to be considering a full range of information when we conduct those assessments. And frankly, also, to make sure that they can be updated. I mentioned that this assessment will be uh, provided annually. Um, that is both to continue uh, to have the transparency, which is essential for the legitimacy, as I mentioned, for our counterterrorism actions, but also to reflect the latest in intelligence across all sources, as well as information from outside groups, those outside the government who may have different uh, and differing in kind types of access. So we want to incorporate all of that. OK, the um, gentleman in the far back there, please. Yep, right in front of the camera. Amitai Tsioni, George Washington. Some of us who studied Islam feel that our best way to deal with this is to work with moderate Islam against uh, violent Islam. And that keep looking for secular liberal forces in Syria, Iraq, and Libya is not going to get us very far. If, if that is for a moment something worth considering, if we have a whole discussion of the situation without ever mentioning the word Islam, how are we going to get the situation that we realize we have to work with one Islam against the other? I think what I'd... Um try and be responsive to what you said, I think I'd say two things. One, um, to address what really is a perversion of Islam in what ISIL and other uh, terrorist organizations are putting forward. Um, as I said, we first have to recognize that the US government is not going to be the best messenger. It's, it's simply the case. We, we are not going to be the most legitimate messenger. Uh, and that is reflected, and that recognition is reflected in uh, the efforts we're taking, as I mentioned, with things like the Global Engagement Center, which is not 
going to be focused on US messages with a government stamp on them, but rather amplifying moderate, credible voices in the region and throughout and uh, from civil society. So recognizing who's going to have the most legitimate voice and doing everything we can to lift that up uh, and not having it be a US, uh, a US message. Um, with respect to working with partners, I think we've been very clear about the difficulty uh, involved in, particularly in Syria. Uh, we have a willing and increasingly capable partner in the Iraqi security forces uh, in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, but of course, um, the increasingly uh, sectarian divisions there, uh, evidenced most recently over the weekend in the uh, ISIL suicide bombing in a Shia area south of Baghdad, uh, is something that is going to con continue to fuel the tensions here. But we're looking for partners that we can work with who can take the fight to ISIL, but importantly, also be around to hold that territory, to be the sources of governance. Otherwise, this is just going to be a never-ending cycle. A gentleman in the fourth row. Yes, sir. Uh, Simon Henderson, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, you made a reference to core al-Qaeda and the uh, remaining leadership of it being in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, there's a very simple question here is, why is it still in Pakistan? Uh, we, last week uh, on this platform, we had Sartar Jaziz, who was uh, the Pakistani uh, advisor on foreign affairs to the prime minister of Pakistan. And he had been in, was in Washington for a strategic dialogue. Uh, did uh, the Pakistanis give any sort of commitment to getting rid of al-Qaeda leadership in Pakistan? And if so, did they give a time frame uh, on when they would accomplish this? So I won't speak specifically to conversations um, uh, with uh, Ms. Raziz, but I will talk generally about our um, cooperation with partners in the region. Look, um, we work with and want to have a strategic relationship with the Pakistanis ac across a range of issues. Um, and they have taken steps over the last year or so uh, to conduct military actions in um, uh, areas of the Fatah that are uh, quite difficult and uh, denied um, to, for a long time to their forces. So we look to work with them uh, against uh, al-Qaeda where we can, uh, and uh, we will continue to do that uh, and continue to try and develop uh, the relationship with the Pakistanis, even as uh, we'll continue to also, I expect, have differences over time as well. OK, the woman in the fifth row there. Yes, ma'am, in the blue. Mm -hmm. Courtney Raj, Committee to Protect Journalists. You cited the 90,000 Twitter followers. That actually was a Brookings study that also included many journalists in that figure. And my question in this countering violent extremism agenda, which includes content removal, um, with extremism being ill-defined, even harder to define than terrorism, and the second pillar of partnerships, and many of those partners being some of the worst human rights abusers um, in the world who are systematically imprisoning journalists, which are, of course, an important source of information and accountability. Some of the only information coming out of Raqqa is from Raqqa's being slaughtered silently, which is a citizen journalist collective. So. You know, when Egypt has become the second worst jailer of, of journalists and is a key ally in this fight, how is the U.S. going to make sure that these, you know, countering violent extremism messages and initiatives are not leading to the use of terrorism and extremism charges to jail opponents, to jail opposition, activists, and journalists? So you've hit upon one of the biggest challenges we face, which is, uh, as you pointed out, um, content removal is a is a really difficult issue. I talked about working with um, uh, technology companies here to uh, help them address content that violates their terms of service. This is something that they're doing on a voluntary basis because, and I firmly believe this, they don't want their platforms used by terrorists. Uh, these are patriotic companies that don't want uh, to see their 
uh, great engines of innovation uh, used to perpetrate heinous, heinous acts. Um, but it is also a system that is uh, extremely difficult uh, to manage, uh, not the least of which is identifying that content in a scalable way that, uh, that does violate their terms of service. You talked about um, countries in the region and elsewhere uh, that um, uh, discriminate against or take repressive actions against journalists. In every instance, the United States government condemns those types of actions and has very, very pointed uh, conversations with um, governments where, uh, although we maintain uh, important strategic relationships and counterterrorism relationships, we also uh, don't give any quarter uh, when it comes to the repression of uh, dissidents, of journalists, uh, and those working in the human rights community. If I could just use my brother to follow up, you talked about the cooperation from some of the companies in Silicon Valley in dealing with um, terrorist, extremist content. Um, I'm not sure that that story is out there. I, I was certainly surprised when I started hearing about the extent to which some of these companies are going to help take down that content. And that's a lot of resources and a lot of effort that, that isn't reflected on the bottom line. Um, do you have any more comment about sort of the breadth of that cooperation? So I think, you know, we, we've talked about this. We've had a range of conversations, some of which I mentioned in my remarks. Um, we also went out a number of uh, the uh, most senior members of the President's of National Security Team went out to Silicon Valley uh, back in January and sat down with a whole range of uh, representatives and senior uh, leaders from the tech industry uh, to frankly broaden the conversation to a whole range of issues that we can work together on to go after exactly these types of things. What is the content that is um, being uh, perpetrated on their sites that they, and uh, using their services and their platforms, that they have no interest in um, allowing to be used on their platforms? Uh, there are things that they do and have done for years, whether it's to address child pornography, to address fraud, to address scams on their uh, platforms that might also be applicable in this space. This is not to kind of oversell and oversimplify, because for the reasons uh, that the young woman indicated, this is a very difficult, challenging problem. Um, but if we don't get the best minds, the best, most innovative thinkers uh, who know their systems best uh, to help uh, us work on it, uh, we've, you know, uh, we're not going to be able to confront this challenge because, as I said in my remarks, it is a wholly different task than even uh, the ones uh, we dealt with just a few years ago and when you uh, sat in the same windowless office in the West Wing that I occupy. Well, I think, just think that's a good news story that might, not, mm -hmm. it might get lost in all the discussion about the Apple controversy right now, the, the level of effort that we're seeing from- Good news stories getting lost, I'm yeah, shocked. Yeah, something new and different. <laughs> Okay, gentleman in the fifth row with the tie. Oh. <laughs> <Have you? laughs> a reporter with a tie. How do you know? <laughs> uh, Eric Schmidt with the New York Times and a council member. Um, Lisa, thank you for your presentation. And uh, you mentioned Libya and the fact the U.S. has taken some action there. Uh, and yet, your colleagues in the administration have talked about the need to try and help encourage the development of a unity government there, which still is, seems somewhat far off. Um, how long do you think the administration and its partners can wait uh, for this government to form and perhaps form in a, in a way uh, to marshal the resources on the ground to combat ISIS at a time when the ISIS ranks on the ground have more than doubled in just the last few months? How long you can wait before that threat poses a threat to Americans and American interests in the region? Thank you. Simple answer. We're not waiting. We're not waiting. Um, as uh, our actions have shown, um, where ISIL presents a threat, uh, and as I noted, uh, we conducted an action to take out uh, ISIL's leader, uh, their emir in Libya, Abu Nabil. Uh, yeah, we've seen that. That guy's already been replaced, and the training camp you hit is in the far west. You're not doing anything against the, the stronghold. I mean, what, what actually, you have no allies on the ground fighting them on the ground as you even do in place parts of Syria. You're, you're quite right. Um, my point is that we're not waiting to address threats that are posed to the United States. However, uh, we are, as you also noted, uh, working assiduously 
to uh, support the UN efforts to form uh, a government of national accord. Uh, and you have rightly pointed out that that is a uh, ongoing process that has uh, experienced fits and starts. Um, so the point is, we've got to do both. We're not waiting for one to happen uh, in order to address threats that are posed to the United States, but ultimately uh, to have a lasting impact and to try and have a partner on the ground with whom we can make uh, a, a lasting uh, presence, a lasting impact on ISIL's uh, efforts to uh, form a stronghold in Libya, we uh, will need and want to have a, a partner on the ground. And that's why, amongst other reasons, we're working with European partners, with regional partners, to uh, try and get this government of national accord formed. Gentleman right here in the second row, please. <coughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm Mike Halsell, Johns Hopkins Sice. I want to begin by congratulating you both for your performance today and for the work you do. Um, this follows on Mr. Schmidt's question. It has to do with allies. You say that ISIL is the number one threat to the United States in terms of terrorism. We have 66 allies. I don't minimize for a minute the difficulties of coordinating 66 allies to do anything, let alone to fight a war on the ground. But it's been more than a year since ISIL's held Mosul. They're in charge of Raqqa. It's difficult for me to believe that it is not militarily possible to dislodge them. I know we've made progress in the western part of Iraq. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk about the constraints that are preventing us and our allies from basically doing it. I mean, I know the president doesn't want American boots on the ground. Understand that. American public opinion probably wouldn't e either. There are forces in Iraq that don't want us there. Muqtad al-Sadr said the other day, you're, you're going to kill Americans. I mean, what are, the, what are the constraints that are preventing us from getting ISIL out of this huge territory that they occupy? So I'd say a few things. One, I, I think I might challenge the premise a little bit, uh, which is to say that, uh, and I've noted the progress that we've made, and, and you noted in your question, um, this is not only about military power. You're quite right. Uh, and I mentioned it. We've got the mightiest military on Earth. Um, but the lasting defeat of ISIL, certainly in, its co in the core, what we call the core in Iraq and Syria, is going to also have to happen by having forces on the ground and governance on the ground to, uh, to keep those places that have been cleared to allow them to get repopulated, like Tikrit, for example. 99% of the population has now returned to Tikrit after uh, working with the Iraqi security forces. They pushed, some months ago, they pushed ISIL out. But to have that lasting um, uh, solution in Tikrit, in Ramadi, in a whole host of places, that means doing the painstaking work of removing the IEDs, allowing people to come back, uh, uh, having a governance structure, uh, having a, a situation where people can feel safe coming back. We've done that in Tikrit. We're doing it in Ramadi. We've made uh, huge strides working with our partners, closing off that uh, segment of the uh, Syria-Turkish border, which is allowing and has allowed for the flow. So all of these things are very, very complicated, time-intensive, uh, laborious, painstaking efforts to allow not only for the military efforts to push ISIL back, to constrict them in the heart uh, where they've been operating. And that's what we're doing. We're squeezing them right in the heart. Uh, but to, to enable the return of the populace, to have them feel safe, that's a longer effort which requires those partners on the ground and requires uh, the uh, ability for them to feel safe and to, feel, to be able to come back. Gentleman right here, the bow tie. Yes, sir. That's why I wore the bullet. Perfect. <laughs> Stand out. Ray, Ray Tanter, uh, former NSC staffer. Uh, you've, I think you did an outstanding job defining the threat. And you spent a great deal of time, and most of the questioners talked about the threat. But you didn't say so much about coordination within the bu American bureaucracy. I was speaking with a friend of mine at Kirkland and Ellis, Susan Davies, and she said on mundane issues like visas, 
it should be easy to, for the White House to coordinate the Department of Homeland Security, State Department, and various other uh, agencies of government. But when it comes down to more difficult issues, you would expect even more difficulty in coordination. So could you address this issue of how, what are your, who are your allies within the administration? <laughs> Yeah, and the bureaucracy was a well-oiled machine when I yeah. left. What happened? That's true. Yeah, I could blame it all on. Perfectly. I could blame it all on Ken. <laughs> um, look, uh, the um, uh, as has been noted, the role that I play, that Ken formerly played, uh, is to coordinate the policy development, the policy implementation, um, and to make sure that uh, what has been laid out is getting implemented. We do it every day. Uh, I've got a host of allies around uh, the Situation Room table. Does that mean we always agree on everything and everything's smooth sailing? Absolutely not. But I'll tell you one thing. When I'm sitting in the chair, chairing a meeting of the Deputies Committee or on a Homeland Security, the Principals uh, Committee meeting, uh, I frankly don't want uh, everyone uh, singing in unison because that's when I know that uh, everyone's fallen prey to groupthink, and that's a real problem in my view, and I bet uh, that Ken would agree with me. If, and I've sat at different, in different chairs around that table throughout my career. I used to represent the Justice Department at that table, uh, and I was very conscious, as I'm conscious now as the chair of those meetings, in making sure that every component of the government that sits at that table that weighs incredibly difficult, complex issues is playing their role. Do I mean being parochial? Sometimes. But I want them playing their role, giving their best view, weighing the equities that are important to them, because what's going to be important to the State Department is going to be different than what's important to the Treasury Department. And if we don't get all of that out on the table, then I haven't done my job in forming and weighing and chewing on the most difficult issues and presenting the president with the most well thought through uh, varied options on the toughest issues that we face as a nation. Okay, that very, very strong point. Um, I think we've run out of time, so um, thank you for your questions. These were all great questions. Um, thank you for appearing, Lisa, but also let me just take a moment, reflect on what she said earlier on about the different jobs she's had. She's had a series of very tough jobs and very tough times and has really tremendously served this country and sticking with it for as long as you have. So thank, thank you. you. Thank Enjoy you. Me. Thank you.